So today I'm talking with Tim Malnick. He is somebody I'm not quite sure how to describe, so I'm probably going to turn it over to him to describe him better. He's like me doing a number of different things, having a lot of curiosities, trying to engage in many different ways with the world, uh, has spent some time in academia, has worked as an activist, and most interestingly, I think something emergent for me and I want to explore today with you, Tim, is uh, around your work with money and the money workshops you hold with people. I think that's such an interesting lens to get to some of the deeper fears, insecurities, and desires people have about their lives. So welcome to the podcast, Tim, and maybe we just kick it off with you uh, adding some of the missing pieces uh, from my uh, sure. intro. Sure. Yeah, I mean, first, thanks for having me, because we don't really know each other. Um and we were sort of tweeting each other for a while. So I, you know, I'm increasingly interested in your work and your writing, and I'm really happy to have, have this conversation. I'll, I'll start with a more, a little bit more official bio, and then maybe we'll get into the inner story a bit later. Um, professionally, my training is as an organization psychologist. So I originally studied psychology, then I did all sorts of weird and wonderful things. I, I didn't jump on a career ladder and we maybe talk about that more um, but eventually in my late 20s I trained in organization psychology so what does that mean I do work around I do one-to-one -one work coaching leadership development I work with groups and teams occasionally I work with whole systems or organizations but the other thing I always say about my background is I, as you said I've always had an activist thread uh, in my 20s, that was, you know, I was going sometimes on environmental demos and protests, and I was working voluntarily for like green organizations and campaign organizations. So then when I moved into professionally working in business and organization, I was always very clear. I was never interested in using my skills to just uh, advance business as usual, just just because for me, it never made any sense. I, I just... Again, we can get on to that. So I've always used stuff around personal development, leadership development for either people who are exploring new ways of doing stuff uh, or for people who are already pioneering kind of better ways or trying to reinvent stuff around work and how business responds to environment. Yeah. Why didn't you follow a track? What, what was like, take me back to when you yeah, were either deciding yeah. to or not to do something like that. How well, old were you? What were you yeah. thinking about? I mean, it's it's hard to know the time when you decided not to do something. But right. but I, I think the honest truth and, and I, you know, I've looked back at this in different ways and I'm not always sure it was a mature or wise decision. But I think the the truth is two things. One is I've just never been a natural planner. So the idea of actually sitting and thinking, where do I want my career to be or where do I want to get was very alien to me. And actually, I kind of admire people who could do it and did do it, but it just has never been my nature. And the other thing is, I think I always have had a countercultural mindset. And, I, and as I've grown up and matured, I understand that better. And now hopefully I can, get, I can use that in a helpful way. I think the truth is in my teens and 20s, it was just a bit of a rebellious, you know, it was like a fairly unconscious, semi-conscious, I just don't want to go and work, work in the machine. And it wasn't any more well thought through than that, really. Did you have any mentors or people that were taking on conventional paths in your life or family? I often find that people mm -hmm. that do take these paths have one or two people that uh, kind of give them a permission to explore in a different way. Well, you know, that's really interesting. I think I had, I had, I actually had the opposite in some way. And then just when I left university, I suddenly moved into this countercultural world that was so interesting and exciting. So in terms of my upbringing, fairly typical uh, kind of professional middle class family, born and raised in London. My dad worked in the kind of uh, investment sector. And I was reflecting on this before, before we were talking. And I think from my dad, I always had the story growing up that he didn't much enjoy his work. I, I think actually later on, I realized he kind of enjoyed it more than he let on. 
but the the thing I absorbed from him is that he did he wasn't really enjoying his work, but he was working. You know, in London finance, he was earning pretty well. He was quite senior, and somehow I think I absorbed a message from him that from a young age that that following the professional script and succeeding doesn't necessarily guarantee happiness. So my dad wasn't radical or revolutionary at all, but he was very, very uh, accepting guy, like not just of me and my brothers, but generally in life, he was a very, very non-judgmental. And he was very honest and he would say, you know, I, I don't have the secret to life or anything. So, So I think somehow that gave me this idea that on one level, there is a script that we all follow, and, and we can talk later with the money work about what I absorbed. But at the other time, the script doesn't necessarily deliver <laughs> what we're looking for. And then the other thing that happened after I left university was I just kind of coincidence or you know synchronicity, I just suddenly met a whole load of people who were just more interesting, more uh, engaged, more creative than anyone I'd met at university in three years, which had been in some ways quite boring. And these people, again, were all really challenging norms. And I just thought, wow, this is like the university I wanted. Anyone that stands out in that group? No, you know, I really think of it as a group. And that was one of the most wonderful things. It was a subculture. Of course, at the time, I didn't think, but it really was a group. And there was a lot of people doing music. I did quite a lot of music and performing at that time. We formed this kind of amateur fire juggling circus thing that we would then go and perform at Oxford Colleges and Glastonbury Festival. Some of the people were political, so I got into that. So it was almost like this little community of people, all of them just doing interesting, creative things, and none of them following the obvious path. And it was really exciting for me at the time. It sounds like you stumbled into, in your early 20s, a life you felt you wanted to keep living. And then when you went back into maybe a more formal scripted path, uh, you kind of always knew what you, what you wouldn't compromise on. Does that resonate? Yes. In, in a way, it does. Um, and, but then I realized something a bit later on. So you're sort of right, and there was another thing. And, and this, in a way, this, this double thing, which I'm going to say, laid the seed for the work I do. Because I had two or three really wonderful years, you know, not worrying at all about career, and I was doing a bit of teaching and a bit of music, and, and I was hanging out with other people, so money just sort of worked. And a lot of the ideas you explore which a lot of people find easier when they're younger, although it doesn't have to be. But then I do have another side. I have a side that's kind of ambitious, right? And I have a side that wants to have some sort of impact on the world. And I realized that I was a little bit um, against it or a little bit uh, judging that side. It was almost like I'd split, you know, the ambitious people go off and run business and all the cool hippies who are interesting just hang about. And so in my mid twenties, I went through, it was actually a very kind of painful year where I realized I don't think I belong in either of these groups at the moment. I realized I wanted to kind of get on and somehow contribute and create in a particular way, but I didn't want to do it in a way that felt like I was sucked into the, the machine. And that's when after a really tough year and I trained a bit as a gardener and a landscape gardener, and I was thinking about ecological design and that's when I made the first conscious career decision I was probably about 27 and I thought I'll train in organization psychology because that can allow me to work in mainstream situations but hold a perspective that's maybe quite spiritual or quite countercultural. and it's kind of made sense since then just about <laughs> That kind of role gives you permission to yeah. uh, bring different modes of thinking into yeah. an organization. You're almost like a internal corporate anthropologist, uh, depending on the role. Um, and yeah, I've seen many, many interesting people in the organizational psychology uh, track. I think it can give you that role. And yeah, I think it's... like a lot of this stuff, it can easily get a little bit co-opted without people oh, yeah. realizing it. I... I think it's an interesting role because 
it's this role that kind of promises a grand vision of transforming yeah. organizations, at least academically, or at least the kind of people it attracts. But the actual fields you can make a good living in doing it are very narrow. And business leaders' conceptions of how to work with organizational psychologists is incredibly limited. Uh, so I, I saw a lot of people on the other spectrum, right? It sounds like your goal was how do I transcend these worlds? I found a lot of people in like deep into the belly of the beast in the corporate world and just cynical. And yeah. ah, this is stupid, but what are you going to do? We're just going to do our psychometric reports and move on. Yeah. Um, and, and I understand it because, and this has been the essence of my work, which, you know, in some ways it's more of a struggle because there's just less, uh, less corporate interest, there's less money flows towards it, and we'll get on to money. But for me, it's always been clear for myself that the only interesting and worthwhile thing from my take is to use those psychology skills, development skills, in service of questioning the purpose of, you know, what, what does this business exist to do? How does it relate to the wider world, in, including past and future? And the people in it, you know, to first and foremost, what is their purpose and what's their life journey? And you can work as an organization psychologist doing some of that, but a lot of people, that's not what they want. As you know, they don't want to do that thinking, and that's okay. Um, it was just not for me. Yeah, and this is why I'm actually a pretty big fan of working in organiz large organizations, institutions, or corporations. I think people think I want everyone to just like blow up their life and go travel to Bali at 19. But I think learning how the world act actually works uh, saves you from getting trapped. And I think a lot of activists, artists struggle with this, this starving artist script, and we can't sell out. Um, I think those are not very helpful beliefs because there's far more uh, potential and possibility by learning how to transcend those different worlds, speak to different languages and figure out how the world actually works rather than just being angry that it's not how you want it to be yet. I mean, I think what you said, actually, there's, there's so much in what you just said. So if I unpick it a little bit, I, I agree. The first thing I think is just to transcend, to, to, to encounter and be in a system like a work system or an economic system and engage with it so you can transcend it. That's, you know, that's a wonderful, magical thing. It's, it's challenging, right? So even to be able to think that way, I think, is, is, is kind of a gift or, or good fortune. Um, I think this thing about the starving artist or the activist. So that's one of the groups I work quite a lot with. One of the nice things about my group now is I could be working with, you know, corporate lawyers in the morning and then activists in the afternoon and then, you know, local community organizers. And I really like that. I think it enriches the work I do in different groups. So one of the groups I work with is often people who broadly would, would identify as activists or they're social pioneers, social innovators, uh, campaigners as well. And yeah, I think you're right. Um, there's a lot of shadow. There's a lot of unconscious shadow in people who identify as wanting to change the world. And actually one of the workshops I run is called Power Activism and the Shadow. And, and it's the idea that um, there's, a, you know, people, it's very easy to do. You, you stand in a position, you critique the mainstream, but then you're always in, in kind of unconscious opposition. And, and then you're actually avoiding whole parts of your own human nature, which you're probably going to need to make change happen. That so resonates like with me. I think working in strategy consulting, everyone kind of buys into this. We're, we're making large scale change. Uh, and a lot of it is top-down work, but I yeah. think so many people are also fighting that internal battle of kind of resenting the work they're doing, not believing in it. And I felt that powerfully. I think what I've realized now is I kind of had to disappear for a while and go save myself <laughs> and improve my ability to engage with the world and um, figure out who I am first. I, I think going into the corporate world at 22 and even in internships before that, I kind of skipped some psychological development stages. And 
I, I didn't mean to cut you off. I mean, if you have more, keep going, but I'd be interested to like how you think about how the default path kind of maps on to our inability to move towards these different developmental stages. So intuitively, even before I did any training, you know, for whatever reason, I always just feel that humans have their own path. Um, you know, it, I, I, I mean, I, I could imagine where it comes from, but I don't know why I think that. I, maybe I'll come back to that. But, but um, it's just the way I'm wired, we might say. Um, and, and in all sorts of, you know, psychometric profiles, I'm like that. I'm an introverted, feeling, reflector type. It's like I tune into people and people are fascinating and people's inner journey are, are very, to me, very meaningful. So, so the, the reason I say that is because I, I always take that as kind of primary, really. And one of the things I've studied a bit is like other cultures, you know, indigenous cultures, this is much more explicit. You know, when a child comes into the world, there's a sense of here is a unique soul, you know, maybe depending on the culture, maybe they're bringing something or some gift or skills for the for the community. And then even the idea of you're given a name that reflects that and maybe at different stages in your life, you have initiations, you choose your name. So it seems to me, it's not something I've studied in detail, but it seems that other cultures are more centered around the idea of, you know, a human journey and what you contribute as being kind of unique and moving in different phases. And I think because of our industrial model of the last, you know, 150, 200 plus years, and we could get into this around money, it's like we've we created this sausage factory. You know, education is a sausage factory and and it's like a template. And so in answer to your question, I think that, you know, evidently the template doesn't really fit everybody. And in some ways it, it can't fit anybody totally. And if you're lucky, if you're lucky, and there are some people like this, the thing that they love to do is something where money will flow towards it and the path will more or less map to their own kind of deeper individuation process, psychological development. But for most people, it's not, it's not like that, you know, and there's different things that need to happen at different times. Yeah, I, the way I think about the default path is that it's a story, right? And it's become so strong because of how successful it has been in creating wealth for individual families, individuals, uh, and societies, right? So the faith in it makes a lot of sense because it's succeeded. But over time, it's we're mapping our lives onto a very simplified story of how we should live our life. And it doesn't have any guidance or wisdom in it, right? It's, it's more like go to school, study hard, get a job, work hard, uh, retire. Um, and the problem is in the work hard part is basically an entire adulthood <laughs> of like many stages and shifts and struggles and challenges. And people don't really have a story for how they're supposed to be navigating that. I think people are becoming way more open now and willing to talk about things, especially in my generation. Um, and that's great, but we also have to deal with the tremendous amount of damage and the ignor ignoring of the shadow of previous generations. I think maybe in people like your father, he was pretty good with it, right? But there probably was a deeper disconnect he never got to or understood, right? And and the reason you wouldn't explore it in that generation is because the amount of options that we have didn't exist. It's so easy to work on your own now. Uh, but 30 years ago, it wasn't actually a real option, especially if you wanted to have a somewhat intellectual life. Yeah, I mean, it's, culture is, is completely different. Um, I mean, I, I, I go back to a few things you say. So, so I, I absolutely agree. You know, there's a modern industrial template or schema and it's a construction. It's a historical social construction and it's collapsing. That's the first thing to say. It's collapsing. It's taking some time 
and there's a lot of kind of noise and turbulence, but it, but it is collapsing. And, and there's a few reasons why it's collapsing. Uh, and one thing I would, I would say, Paul, is, you know, you said it's been successful because it's created wealth. And I would say, well, yeah, you know, within a very narrow window, like a certain period of history for a small group of people, <laughs> it appeared to be quite successful in a small range of terms, right? In other words, it created immense material financial success for a limited group of people at certain places in the globe for a few, a generation or two. But the consequences of that mindset and that success have been, I would, I would say, two or three things that have been, as economists would say, externalized, or as psychologists would say, a little bit repressed. One is that model is destroying the planet. So, and, and this is part of my work has always been about connecting work and, and personal journey to these, these wider issues. So I would find it hard to say that any system has created real wealth, real wealth, that's also destroying the kind of living systems of the planet. The other is, and again, we don't tend to see this, you know, maybe in, in, the, in the industrialized West, but a lot of that wealth came at the expense of large groups of people in other countries. <laughs> And we had this idea of, oh, well, it'll all trickle down and everyone will come up. But again, we're not so sure that's what's really happened. So I'm not sure it's been successful beyond a fairly narrow uh, set of, of criteria. Yeah, I, th I think that story of a collapse is very tempting to fall into. But mm -hmm. I've been challenged myself to mm -hmm. reframe that, mm -hmm. mostly from living in Asia and seeing the real wealth created um, in terms of enabling people to escape real suffering. I think like in the, it's weird. We, I mean, Balaji Srinivasan calls this like the ascending rest of the world and the descending West, right? So I wonder sometimes in the West, I don't know if there's collapse as much as a reshuffling and kind of a, we're in this liminal space where we don't know what comes next and people are clinging to this past version of like these lives we were supposed to get, right? I call that accidental meaning. Like people stumbled upon meaning be through the default path, but it's not working anymore and they don't know how to get it back, right? Um, and I, I actually think like the amount, like, I mean, I see it just in like Taiwan and my in-laws, the amount of people in the past 30 years that were, that entered into a middle class that are, that was far better than um, previous situations is profound. The psychological effect on the country is profound. And I think there is much less suffering. Um, is that whole system sustainable uh, over the long term? Uh, on our current version of it, no. Um, but I, I think, like, I, and challenge me here, but like, I always think like the collapse narrative. I don't know what to do with that. Um, I don't think it's optimistic. I think like I am. I think we're actually in like a reshuffling of scripts, paths, um, ways of organizing our economy, and people like you are helping us imagine those new pathways. Hmm. Um, but I think collapse is very like rich industrial West way of looking I, at I it. I understand. So look, this is a hugely complex topic and oh, we, yeah. we can get into a bit. We could do a whole podcast well, on I, I was going to say we could have another chat. So one thing I realize is um, when I use the word collapse, actually I realize I'm using it more from my Buddhist thinking than what a lot oh, of climate or economic people. So, so that may have been, um, f for me, I think I was using it in terms of um, that conceptual structures and belief systems are starting to loosen up and fall away, right? So I wasn't making a judgment on how the world's going. I mean, clearly there yeah, are that, difficulties and problems. But I, I think a lot of Asia would probably agree with you then. <laughs> right. So, and, and that's, and, and that's, I think there's, let, let's say there's at least two or maybe many levels of collapse. So one is, and actually I've got some very uh, close friends, colleagues who are incredibly learned and uh, knowledgeable, who are deeply, deeply concerned on the, on the environmental level. And we won't go into that 
now and that's not really my area but but certainly i respect them enough to know that there are some very 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 worrying trends out there wh- which are the product of our current industrial model so i'm not disagreeing with anything you say about raising material standards but you know there's a problem in in how we're doing it with 8 billion people and we need to figure that out yeah i think we're i think where we align is that um so i, I I mentioned this before. I call this accidental meaning, right? We're basically copy pasting what previous generations were also copy pasting on terms of how to live their lives. Previous generations got lucky, like as you said, probably like a select few kind of people, a uh, limited kind of person. I mean, in the US, for example, it was like white men and nuclear families. Um, now there's way less nuclear families, a lot more single parents. Uh, it's way more diverse workforce and people are applying that template and like, I bought the house, I have the job, where's the meaning, (laughs) right? Um, so I think that's probably where we agree and probably gives us a good way to, to shift into some of the money and organization stuff we want to talk about too. Okay. Let's just, so we'll, we'll do the, um, environmental or we'll do that another time but yeah i'd love to talk about money and organizations and yeah i mean i think the environment and organization stuff is interesting because maybe the other point i was trying to make was we're mapped to these abstract stories Mm -hmm. and we're so removed from any connection to the earth yeah right Uh, my grandfather was a farmer Mm -hmm. um I started, my first job was sitting in front of a desktop computer. (laughs) How do we even think about our relationship to the world or earth when we're in the world of bits? And I think that's the the hard thing to transcend. I agree. Um, I mean, do you want me to say in terms of the work around money and organizations around that, or did you have particular questions in that direction? Yeah, wherever you want to take that. Well, okay. The thing that comes up for me is about the body. When you, when you ask how do we connect to the, the natural world, um, I think whatever our work or whatever our take on what's going on, right, one of the things I'm really interested in in my work is uh, simply put, we have stories. You said, you know, there's a whole lot of stories about career or we might say they're beliefs or structures. But what we're usually talking about there is, is kind of concepts, right? You know, we have concepts, we have ideas. And um, again, from the Buddhist point of view, we could get very interested in where are these ideas or are they mine or in, their, in, in the atmosphere. But what I found in my, in my coaching work and my workshops is one of the first steps to helping people separate the stories that we're all living in and our actual lived experience, which are, you know, life, is just to go to the body in, in different ways. And that can be very, very simple, right? You know, as you say, if we're in screens, in front of screens all the time, we're just not connected to our physical bodies. So as a starting point, um, I do a lot of kind of embodiment stuff. And in the money work, and there's a particular process that we won't get into today, but what you often notice is people will tell you a story about money and their bodies, once you get to notice it, and once you help them notice it, will be will be revealing another story, which which I choose to believe is actually a deeper truth. So it helps us untangle, you know, in your terminology, all the stuff I've been told about, you know, get a job, get a career, get this money, get your mortgage. And what's my actual experience as a human being? When do I actually feel alive? When do I feel free or creative or secure? Or... And that's a good entry to investigate this stuff, I think. Yeah, my journey was learning to trust that intuition yeah. of when I feel alive. I, unlike you, was good at figuring out how to be a planner. Uh, so I broke into really good jobs and a path. And once you're in that world, it's really easy to just keep it going. And if you just keep it going, you will become rich, popular, and seen as a good person. Um, and 
I walked away from that, which was kind of crazy. Um, but I described the first 10 years of my career as I was living out ideas of what other people thought uh, a life should look like. And now I'm really trying to follow what brings me alive. And it's really hard. And I think something people don't understand about my path is I'm not supremely confident. I still have those scripts floating around in my head. It's impossible to ignore them, right? I'm in New York City. I know that money is important and everyone's judging the crap out of me having or not having money. Um, but what I've also found is that if I am bravely leaning into what like my heart is telling me, what my gut is telling me to do, it actually leads to a life I want to keep living. And a different and more profound kind of confidence. And, and again, you, you say so much. So, so number one, a lot of my work is um, about becoming conscious of the scripts, right? I mean, maybe at some point we get to some point and they all collapse, fall away, dissolve. But, but actually you can go a long way with the difference of being driven by a story yeah. compared to just saying, oh, it's a story and it still surfaces and it might provoke me and you start to be aware of how it drives you. Until yeah. we're aware of how these stories and beliefs about you know work, money are driving us, we, we are absolutely just stuck in the story. What questions do you ask people to uncover some of those? What to uncover their scripts? Yeah. Um, well, so it will depend in, in different places. I kind of work from two sides. So I will come back to that, at what I call detective work. In the workshop, we call it detective work. Um, I also work with what I call kind of dreaming work. I don't mean when you're asleep, but also reconnecting with the other parts of us that are beyond the scripts, whether you call it a longing, a passion, something in our heart, because... I think our industrial culture does a really, really good job of just squashing and neglecting that as well. And, and then, it, then that's tricky because then you're caught in the stories and you're not encouraged what you say to believe, you know, that there's some wisdom in what brings me alive. So I will work with, with both. In terms of the detective work, um, one thing is just creating a space. So I run this two-day thing. It's called the Money Workshop. And I start by saying money is a taboo and money drives or ideas around money, beliefs around money and money numbers drive so much human behavior and we're largely entirely unconscious. So we need to be detectives. And then we do different things. We play games with money. So I ask people to bring money to the workshop or we do it online as well. And we, I won't say what games we do, but that can provoke stuff, right? Even if I say to you, we're going to you know, bring some money, how much you bring is up to you. <laughs> we're going to play some games with it. That will start to surface, right? You know, whatever yeah. response you have, you might laugh, you might feel nervous, you might think this guy's going to take my money. And, and so all I say is just, it's detective work. Whatever you, however you respond is something about your story. We get people to look at their biography, their family history, and also kind of most relevant to, I think, you and, and this podcast, we also work with the question, what is it you would love to do if it weren't for money? And then we do thought experiments. So why don't you do it? And that's not advocacy. I'm not saying you must do it. I'm saying what comes up for you if I say, well, you could just do it. And then it's about shining the light of consciousness and people, you know, write pages of notes and reflections and gradually through looking at their personal history, their current situation, the things they'd love to do, but have decided they can't do maybe some games. It's like they start to triangulate on what for them right now are the core constructs that are keeping this whole thing in place. And then we can do some work to free that up, which is, is very beautiful and, and not, not for the podcast. But again, it's actually body work in the end. It's not just belief. It's about really um, connecting with a deeper wisdom in the body that's about life. And that's, you know, I often say on the workshop, 
Life has been around for billions of years. The economic system has been around for, depending on how you see it, you know, a hundred or a few hundred or maybe even a few thousand. And yet life has organized for much longer. So maybe we trust that as an organizing principle. An influential book I read was Charles Eisenstein's mm. Sacred Economics. Mm. And I read this at the beginning of my self-employment journey. And it was really powerful because I was grappling with a lot of money insecurities. If you ever just want to go head on with money insecurities, just quit your job without a plan or an income stream. Yeah, well, and- you, you did You did the intense version, which is, which is why I'm so interested. It's like what you did is you did the kind of do it first and then reflect on what the hell's going on. Whereas I work with people to do it more gradually, but I think it's great what you did. That's why I'm so interested in your, in your writing. Yeah. And I, I think I, I had so many realizations in those first few months. It was so powerful. And I think I got sidetracked a little too with Charles Eisenstein's work around the gift economy and I just was so desperate to reject my previous path of make as the default in the corporate world, is, and it makes sense, is just always try to make more. Yeah, maximize the number. Right. And uh, I mean, that's one of the better ways we have of organizing an organization, uh, but it doesn't nourish uh, most people in terms of how they're living their life. And I was so desperate to reject that. And I really wanted to just embrace this gift economy. Oh, what if I'm just giving to people and open to receiving gifts? Uh, the My conclusion of really leaning into that was that I'm going to go broke if I do that. <laughs> and I think that sent me on a deeper journey of not wanting to reject my previous path and not wanting to reject the world or reject work and really one, try to find the work I actually want to do and then figure out the life structure that works for me around that. Right. Money's not going away. Uh, Most of work, most people are going to have to do some work in their lives. That's not going away. So how do you make it work for you? And then it became a lot more fun for me, which was how do you, what is, how can I do a smaller amount of work that won't destroy my soul that helps fund the other stuff I want to keep doing? And I think a lot of people never get to this point because they stay in a full-time reality and they start embracing these wishful thinking frameworks, I like to call like ikigai. Um, ikigai is just a Japanese word that means reason for being. And if you're familiar with East Asian culture and Buddhism, uh, you'd realize that has nothing to do with what you can be paid for. Uh, but we have this diagram that shows like w- what will make a difference, what you can be paid for, what um, the organization wants, what you're good at. Um, that most people can't pull that off uh, or quickly or sustain that um, for many, many years. Um, and I think that leads people astray because it's just layering on additional wishful thinking on top of our default scripts. Well, what, um, I, what yeah, I think that's ahead. doing in, in the terminology of the workshop, you know, in, in, in the money work, I often begin with a very simple story and it, it is a story and it's a construction, but I think it's very helpful. And what we say is there are fundamentally two ways to orient your life there's follow the money path and the money path is everything you do around the getting of organizing saving investing spending worrying about everything around money Uh, it also includes for a significant minority of people ignoring money or wishing it would go away that's all money path right and the promise of the industrial uh, industrial modern society goes some version of You work to get money, and then when you've sorted out the money path, you get to do what you want. You get to live your life, right? Now, there's various um, versions of that, and some people are very lucky that what they love to do brings money. But it's very, very easy to stay stuck in the money path with a future projection. One day when I've sorted this out, 
I'll get to do whatever it is. And it might just be kick back or write the novel or it could be anything. And then the only other real alternative, which you did and you had this intense immersion, right, and, and experienced all sorts of, I'm sure, very strong emotions. The only other choice is you follow life now with and without money as fully as you're able. And sure, a lot of stuff's going to come up and there's ways to work with that. And you follow that. Now, there's a lot more to be said, and I'm aware that's quite a provocative statement. But but with some of the ikigai or things you're talking about, what I notice is there's such a pull back to this money logic. It, it's so strong. And there's such deep stuff around security and all sorts of things there that many, many people, even who are doing alternative things or pioneering things or new paradigm things, they head out and do new things, but still subtly pull back to the money logic. You know, how do I make money from this? Or, and that gets really tricky. It's very understandable. I do it myself. I notice it in myself. So the, the constant provocation or invitation is, do we trust life enough to trust that in some very mysterious way that none of us understand? Here we are. None of us really know what's going on. And we choose to follow and trust some much deeper intelligence. Or are we going to spend our entire life centered around a funny set of weird ideas created by, you know, mainly white male academics in the last few hundred years? Yeah, I think I talked to two interesting groups and they have opposite views of mm. the world. One is fully in love with the money path mm -hmm. and what i mean by love is just that is their world view mm -hmm. um, and the other is open to the life path might be on the money path um, but is leaning in different directions so the group that's more exploratory uh, they typically reach out to me and they're just hungry for information how are you thinking about this how would i reframe this w what did you do to deal with this um, the second group is like well, I don't have enough money. Don't you think like you could do this because you saved enough and like yeah. fun and yeah. etc. cetera. Um, what do you think the financial situation of those two groups are? My experience is that the, the deeper level cuts across all levels of income. So in my experience, people can feel totally free and supported with money, but also they can have no money and feel that way. And also, I've had millionaires who feel entirely insecure and trapped. But also, I want to acknowledge this is very important as well. Of course, none of this is ignoring the fact that there are people with no money who are, are suffering terribly and really struggling. And, I, and there's no part of what I do that ever denies that sort of that level of reality and structural inequalities. And I, I always want to say that. But in terms of the human experience of whether I feel free to go this way or that way, my experience is it has almost zero to do with the numbers that someone associates with in their bank account. It's a human experience at the end of the day. That's, that's my take. I'm seeing the completely right. skewed. Okay. Uh, so how are you seeing towards people with more money having way like, I think the people that come to me with the most extreme fear have the most money. Right. And th they're, Wealth is probably like 25 to 50 times the group that is like more exploratory. And I don't know. I mean, this is selection bias of the people that are reaching out to me. But what I find is I think there is some natural like genetic wiring where there's maybe people like me and you that are just inevitably going to explore these different paths. And but what I find is that people from all over the world and all like different situations are just like, I need to take this different path, especially younger people now, because I think people like us have taken these paths and made it more visible. And they're just like, I need to take this different path. What do I need to know? Help me prepare for my journey. And then I talked to a Google employee with $3 million and they're just like, you know, like you don't understand how expensive it is in San Francisco. Like, I think once me and my wife hit seven, we can finally like take that um, time off to like eventually work on our projects. And I'm like, 
well, what do you like working on? It's like, oh, I don't know. I'll find something. <laughs> well, again, there's there's so much in what you say. I mean, in, in terms of that, yeah, there may be a different, slightly different demographic who contact you and contact me. But the, the fundamental point is, in my experience, there is no amount of money f- for, for people in a certain mindset. If they believe that money brings them the security or the permission or the whatever it is to make that move, they will never make, they will never experience having enough money. And in psychological terms, we say money works a lot through psychological projection. In in other words, if I believe, oh, I thought I had some money here, but I don't. Um, If I believe that the money gives me the human experience of feeling secure enough to follow my thing, I might always maximize money because I believe the money represents security. But another way of saying that is if I believe the security is out there and it will come to me when I have 3 million or 4 million, another way of saying it is I don't feel secure. I'm projecting my human security onto money. And there's many reasons from childhood and culture why we might do that. So what I'm interested in is what does it take to help anyone connect with a, 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 a deep sense of security in themselves, whether they have lots of zeros or very little money that allows them to, to move forward. So that's one of the reasons why rich people stay stuck and try to get more money, because they don't actually feel the thing that they want, whether they want to feel powerful or secure or whatever. They don't, deep down, they don't feel it enough. So they just try and get more money. So they feel, they want to feel more, but they never will with yeah, the numbers. Wh- what are some of the most powerful scripts you've seen that people have about money? Well, I think there's, in, in my work, because I, I don't particularly refer to it as scripts, but I understand what you're saying. I think there's, there's two things. There's ones that are very commonly held, which are really, really important. They come up a lot. Some of the most powerful ones are actually very, very unique to that person. And they can be kind of words or phrases that don't necessarily make a lot of sense to other people. So I'll try and think of examples of both. I mean, common ones that can be powerful for some people are the belief that with money I'm secure and without money I'm insecure. Safety, so there's safety. There's a lot that comes up about uh, success. Mm -hmm. So with money I'm successful and without money it means I'm not. Quite a lot about being responsible. So people say, well, you know, I've got children now. So if I followed my thing, it would mean I would be irresponsible. And because I work with shadow, I, and again, there's a process, I need people to see that we're humans. We can be responsible and irresponsible and both yeah. can support life or we're all successes and we're all failures. And that's okay. Um, it's okay to, you know, well, it's okay if you really see that you're, a failure and you're okay with it and you know you're a success you're kind of free to try stuff out if i can only be a success and never be a failure it's very hard for me to try stuff so there's some of the common ones um in a lot of uh, subgroups sort of activists change the world spiritual groups like you said when you're a bit resisting money um with with the gift economy Sometimes they project that money is sort of money is dirty money is evil right. money money's is evil. the problem and then again, what they're doing is they're putting their own capacity for you know, negativity, evil, unfairness. They're saying, well, that's not me. That's, that's the bankers. So they have to kind of own that stuff. Some of these, what I find, are just untested, right? <laughs> so with me, like cutting the cord of a paycheck and going out there, I experienced this totally different energy and motivation to like save myself from ruin and i quickly realized like i'm not actually going to like let myself just float away to nothingness and be broke right and i mean one of the good things about the industrial economy is it has created incredible amount of ways to make money (laughs) there are more paths to make money now than there ever have been um and some of the scrappiest people I know are the people who are just kind of like hacking a living, right? And they decide, okay, I, I want to surf six months of the year 
and they work like warriors those other six months they're making money in seven different ways different jobs and they just make it work um and i think this is why i often recommend people in full-time work to take a sabbatical um just because it's a safe way of doing what i did of grappling with okay there's no money coming in this month how do i feel what does that mean for my life what is that awakening in me what am i drawn to do it's almost like a retreat you know you could do that have a sabbatical and and, and reflect on the money path and the life path and all of that sort of stuff i i agree i think it's very hard unless you have some sort of you know like some coaching or workshop or take a break it's very hard just to kind of decide to get out of it because it it has such a strong internal logic and as you say you're surrounded by your colleagues and you're surrounded by a system and it, it's very hard so nice i read in your in your um story that you got sick at one point and was that connected with you then deciding to to leave i couldn't work out with the timing how much having to take time out and, and focus on health had been part of your journey yeah i left my job through three years after recovering from that but that experience of I was forced to take leave from my job and I took several months of unpaid leave. And that was the first time I asked myself some of the harder questions about who I am and what do I want out of life. What I discovered is I thought I was a successful worker, but laying at home sick in bed, I was clearly not a successful worker. So that kind of opened a crack in my uh, awareness of trying to figure out who I was and also just going through that and surviving and being okay uh, gave me the confidence to walk away without much of a plan. Um, so that's the missing piece that's like, how could you do that? I, I mean, most people that do what I do at least find some sort of freelance gig to transition or something. Um, I really did it without a plan. It looks really silly looking back. Like I definitely could have made some better <laughs> transition attempts. And I did it in New York where I was spending 6,000 a month at a time. I had never even done a budget until after I left my job and sat down and grappled with what am I actually spending? And I was just shocked at how could I have not done this before? Why did I not lower my cost of living knowing I was going to leave? Uh, it's just really fascinating how powerful our uh, beliefs are and just what we think we should be doing and what we think we need. Um, so that set me, yeah, that set me out in a journey of like testing all those needs. Let's test all my beliefs. That's great. It sounds like somehow you stumbled upon a, actually a very powerful process. And when you say needs, there was something I wanted to come back to with what you said before, because you said, there's more and more ways to make money. Um, and that, of course, that's true, right? With the internet and different things, there's more and more possible ways to make money. But I also think there's a, maybe a downside to that. And Charles Eisenstein writes about this. It's because so much that we didn't used to have to pay for has become monetized, right? And so there's an opportunity maybe for certain people or pri privileged people or people who have a certain resource, they can create money or, or earn money. But one question I think is also important to ask is, are there more ways to actually meet our needs or just to get money? And it seems to me that part of the current story of work and industrialization for many people is actually there's a, there's a diminishment, there's an impoverishment of things that humans really need and love to do and benefit from that didn't used to cost money. I mean, even sort of time and quality time and the, the fact that right now it's wonderful, right? We've all got screens and personal screens so we can all watch what we want when we want. And of course, there's a lot of money flow. So economically, you say it creates growth. But the human need actually just to hang out, you know, and really be in a family unit or with friends and actually have attention and have that sort of sense of togetherness I would say there's less opportunity for that because it's not so easy to sell. So I, I think even this question of um, needing to make money, of, of course, that's part of it. But I, I encourage people who are following the life path to um, realize that their needs may be met more fully 
with and without money. So they may experience less money flow, right? So the stuff I do isn't do what you love and the money will come. Do what you love, you'll get rich. I think it's more interesting than that. It says do what you love and the more you follow it, you will still have your needs met with and without money. And one of the things that many of us do, and I'm sure you notice this when you slow down, and again, I read about how you um, kind of reframed your diary about health, relationships, etc. One of the things that many people do, um, when we're really fully on the money path and in that kind of work pattern, we're often very blind to other things that are trying to come into our life that want to enrich us and help us. And that might just be a beautiful sunset or time or relationship, but it might also be offers of help and support and resources to do the thing we want. It's like we don't see it because we're hypnotized by this logic, which is kind of about me and my effort and generating my numbers. So I often notice that when people step away, sometimes money flows and sometimes money is pretty tough for those people but they often feel wealthier. They often feel enriched. And it's not to do with money. It's because they're getting all of this stuff that they weren't getting before. I don't know if that resonates with you. Oh, completely. I think the second year I left, uh, the second year of self-employment, I decided to lean into life mode, as you put it, and just stop looking for clients. And I had a three or four month stretch in which I didn't do any paid work. Uh, But that was when my life started to open up and I started to experience some of these magical moments uh, of literally just being someone that's available to hang out and present uh, opens you up to relationships and opportunities and interesting things uh, that make your life worth living. And I, I experienced all these like small moments of that. And it told me that I should at least keep going and exploring that. And what I found over and over again is that, yeah, I, I keep finding these deeper connections. Uh, people reach out based on my writing and they want to connect in a deeper way. They offer me their houses to stay. They are like, they send me gifts. They, um, And those relationships instantly become these profound connections that are deeper than people I knew for 10 to 15 years before that. And once you experience that, like what I've realized is having space in my life to have conversations with people, like doing things like this in the middle of the day, super fun. I love doing it. Um, There's no goal. I don't want to have a successful podcast. Maybe I'll experiment with making money here and there, but um, it's really for the conversation itself. And so once you find the work you want to keep doing, as I call it, maybe the, the like what drives your life uh, path, it, all I'm concerned about is protecting it. So I want to keep it alive and protect it. So therefore, like making money in a way is very easy for me because I'm fighting for my life. I'm fighting to keep the journey going. So that's kind of what I mean. And I think it connects to what you built upon um, what I was saying before is that uh, more ways to make money is fine, but you don't just want to like go from like full time to hustling 10 different jobs. It's still still on the money path then. You're still in that logic if you're doing that. Yeah. You want to find the life worth living and then figure out how you can fund it without destroying yourself. (laughs) And I, and I think, you know, again, there's a link to the wider systems because more and more people are questioning the promise about, you know, this model is going to deliver everything for everyone. And, and yes, I, I absolutely get it has delivered material well-being to a lot of people. But, but it's also, again, in, in certain nations, it's also delivering kind of epidemics of meaningless and anxiety and depression and and that's important too. So, so what I what I notice in my work is the wider field, the wider social field and social conversation, is making it much more possible now for people to rethink this stuff. And and as you, it goes back to what you said at the beginning, um, it's whether we call it a reshuffling or a transformation. There's something very very interesting happening, and none of us can say where it will <laughs> lead. I mean, it's immensely complex. And, and again, that's what I often say to people is like, 
you know, if there was ever a time in human history to really trust following, whether it's your body, your heart, your life, surely it's a time when it's pretty clear that the existing model is you know, at least flawed, right? At least going through some profound changes. And, and it goes back to, you know, what I often say, and, and in my bio, I didn't say I've been a politician, right? I was an elected politician in, in Bristol, which is a city in the UK. So I've always been interested in this wider social change. And how do we create change? And is it through business education or politics or whatever? Well, when I meet people like you or I encourage people in my workshops who, who can face that, and it is, it's an existential fear of stepping out and saying, I will follow this different path. And a lot of stuff comes up, right? You know that a lot of stuff comes up and it does and it doesn't go away, but it's but it's real courage. And what I say to people, whether they're interested in the wider political picture or not, is to me, that's an act of radical political leadership. I don't mean voting. I mean, you're actually living in the direction of a new society. And, and I commend anyone who can even tiptoe in that direction, let alone take a few strides, you know. Yeah, and I think we're moving in that direction. I think people have confused politics with entertainment and uh, <laughs> political action and power is really action. Yeah. Um, or, and you actually need to figure yourself out first. You need to embrace that life path if you're really... All the people that have had profound effects on the world have taken that life path um it's and we seem to forget that sometimes yeah no i, th I think that's that's amazing and and you know it's true it's like almost anyone who follows their life path will be shaping the world in a particular way and it can be very subtle and it can appear in any any sphere but oh but yeah people like that you really um notice and they're very attractive you know anyone who's just doing their thing with and without money they are attractive. You know, there's like something that we humans want to connect with around people who are following their path. Yeah. And I think that's where I am. Uh, I push back a little on the like, oh, capitalism's terrible. It's like, actually, we also live in a world in which if people are doing brave things, attention and prestige will still follow to them more so than ever. It's just like 90% of the noise we're polluted with on like online and stuff is all these things outrage us and make us angry yeah i mean i would take a different i would i would have a slightly different position number one is um what's so great about attention and prestige i mean it's nice it's great but but some people i know people who are doing extraordinary things and there's not much attention but their lives feel very very rich well the way i think about prestige is you're getting attention from the people you care about right so even so if you're deciding to be a great father hopefully you're getting prestige from your partner and your family right and for me that's the prestige that matters we've attached prestige to these glorious positions and titles and money and that's not the prestige i'm talking about for me it's create your own prestige and figure out like you're gonna get attention for almost anything you do in the world and you might as well pick the people you want attention from. Yeah. I mean, I, I hear that as it's almost like you, you, we get it in the right order. So the way I would hear it is if I'm chasing prestige or chasing attention, which many of us do, and it's a very human drive, then probably I'm driven by some unconscious lack. And, and, and probably the stuff I do to get that in the end is unlikely to satisfy me. If I follow what's mine to follow and create whatever that is, whether that's a family or just, you know, some amazing project or anything, if I keep doing that, then sooner or later, people will be attracted into that endeavor and that field, whether it's 10 people or 100 people or whatever, but it will be a much more organic communication. And, and I, that's what I'm hearing. That's the kind of good quality prestige that you're talking about, I think. Is that right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Because I think there's um, too too many people out there in the world chasing reputational prestige, and that gets tied up with big numbers and celebrity. You know, there's money path sort of prestige. Yeah, this would be an interesting article for you to right. write: money path yeah. prestige versus life path. Prestige. Yeah, it's beautiful. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll write that down. Uh, but 
Yeah, I, I know we wanted to explore uh, driving change in organizations. Maybe we have a round two, uh, but yeah, I'd love to. I loved uh, exploring these topics. I think you have such a thoughtful um, and a live perspective. I can definitely feel uh, you've done the work uh, in your own journey. Where can people find more uh, about uh, the, what you're up to in the workshops you run? Yeah, they, they can find me on LinkedIn, uh, just with my, my name, Tim Malnick. And my website is www different space, all one word, different space.co.uk. And there's stuff on the site. There's, uh, there's a blog with some writing, there's stuff about the money work, and there's stuff about other programs that I do. Awesome. Well, yeah. thanks for chatting today, Tim, and uh, I'll let you go. It's been a real pleasure, Paul. And I, I would love to talk again. And I, I hope we'll stay in touch, even if we don't do other podcasts. It's, I, I really uh, enjoy your work as well. And uh, yeah, I appreciate it. So thank you.